Fio's ever-growing list of portable music players has undergone a remarkable number of both evolutionary and revolutionary changes throughout its lifespan of just a few short years. Seriously, it's really difficult to think that the first Fio player, the original X3, was released just six years ago. Back then, Fio perhaps wanted to compete with the iPod, but it has now gotten to the point where they can take on some of even the most exotic manufacturers of portable, high-resolution music players. The latest addition to their lineup is this, the M11, which replaces the X5 series of players, and yet it is arguably the best player they have ever produced. The popularity of this device has been so overwhelming that when I was supposed to do a review on it, Samar had completely sold out all units in stock before I could even think about checking it out. Well, they did get new stock, and here is the review. Perhaps the most impressive aspect of the overall look of the M11 is not just the size of the display, but the fantastic screen-to-body ratio achieved here. I mean, we've seen flagship smartphones which cannot get as close as the M11 to a bezel-less front panel. Thankfully, it's not just a form over function affair, as the large 5.15 inch display has a pixel density of around 312 pixels per inch, which means that all forms of text are super crisp. Another aspect I picked up on is just how responsive the touch display is. Seriously, we are talking top of the line smartphone levels of responsiveness here. It's actually quite funny, and perhaps even a little embarrassing, when I think back to the X5 third gen. Sure, the X5 was released more than two years ago, but the M11 makes it feel more like there's a decade between them. The X5 had not only a fairly low resolution display at 235 ppi, but the actual quality of the display was nothing to write home about. It was really reflective, and the touch responsiveness was very unreliable. I think perhaps having used the X5 third gen really makes me appreciate the gigantic leap in product design and quality to be found in the M11. Due to that lack of reflectiveness, the M11 is also far easier to operate outdoors and in sunlight as compared to the X5 third gen. A few things have been carried over from the X5 though, namely the horizontal volume control and the angular design elements on the left and right hand sides. Although on the X5 third gen, those sharp angles were only featured on the left side and the right side remained flat. For the M11, the Fio have opted to give it dual memory card slots, which were again designed with that ultra stealthy look in the form of what you would expect for the SIM card tray on a smartphone. The left side is also where we find the play, pause and skip buttons, and along the top is the power button, which might seem like a strange place to put it if we think about how you would hold the device, but Fire were actually really rather clever here. Yes, having it at the top does make it harder to reach, especially if you try to use the device in your right hand. But if the power button was situated on the opposite side of the play, pause button, then that would create a whole new problem. If you try to press with your index finger towards the top right side, then you'll inevitably end up pressing the play pause button with your thumb, which would make it quite annoying. So putting the power button on the far left of the top edge seems to make more sense. But still, it is a rather chunky device, so reaching the power button will feel a little awkward anyways. Along the bottom is something we've not seen on any of Fire's other players, including their current X7 Mark II flagship and that is a 4.4mm balanced output in addition to a 2.5mm balanced output and a regular 3.5mm single-ended output. The really awesome thing about this is that you can essentially use any headphone you want with the M11 without the need for an adapter or to re-cable them, apart from an XLR connection, of course. The 3.5mm port can also be used for both a line-out connection as well as a 3.5mm digital coax connection. Honestly, there's just so much going on here and you can tell that Fio really invested a lot of time and effort into giving you as many connection options as they could fit into this device. Overall, as I said, it is a rather chunky device and one which is rather awkward to use in the right hand. But given the size, you are more likely to hold it with your left hand whilst navigating with your right hand anyways. My only slight disappointment with the design of this device is over on the back. 
Now, admittedly, this is entirely equivalent with some cosmetic aspects rather than something more practical. First are those high-res audio logos. Well, they're not in the center with the rest of the text, and that ends up bothering me more than what it perhaps should. But then we take a look at the background and see that carbon fiber texture. Well, it's exactly that. It's just a texture. I really think that Fire should have used proper carbon fiber here, which would just have given the device a more premium look. But I'm sure you will agree that I'm just either nitpicking now, or I'm a total carbon fiber junkie. It's probably both, but definitely the latter. In terms of hardware specifications, the M11 is running a Samsung Exynos 7872 hexacore CPU chip, which is clocked at 2 GHz for the two big cores and 1.6 GHz for the remaining four little cores. This is in conjunction with 3 GB of RAM as well. What this results in is a device which runs perfectly smooth, and even more so if you disable the window animations within the developer options. But we'll cover more of that when we discuss the user interface. For the audio specifications, we are treated to a pair of AK4493EQ DAC chips, which allows you to decode up to 384 kHz 32-bit PCM files and up to DSD256 and the super wide frequency response of 10 to 90 kilohertz ensures that the M11 can play back every last frequency we can hear, and even those that we can't. The available power output is also rather impressive, as it can spit out up to 195 milliwatts into a 32 ohm load via the regular 3.5 millimeter jack, and up to 550 milliwatts into the same load from either of the balanced connections. Unfortunately, we are not getting Bluetooth 5.0 here, and instead we are given Bluetooth 4.2. It's not all bad news though, as it means we are still getting access to both the Aptex and LDAC formats. What is quite impressive is that Fire claims that you can get over 48 hours of battery life from the M11 whilst using the LDAC format, but that test was done whilst using an MP3 file, so it's not a totally honest figure. With wired connections, on the other hand, you can get up to around 13 hours from the single ended output and up to roughly 9 hours if using the balanced connections. Another issue that came up was with the dual card slots. There was an issue with one particular brand of 512GB cards where the M11 just could not meet the power supply requirements for that card, and this resulted in some system instability. But as mentioned, this was only with one particular brand, and I believe that was Lexar. Oddly enough, Fire did mention that they were considering to remove one of the card slots from future batches of the M11. This might seem like somewhat of a dumb move, but what will happen once we start seeing 1 and 2 terabyte cards on the market? Will the M11 be able to supply enough power to those? So perhaps sticking to just a single card slot and ensuring that it can deliver plenty of power to whatever capacity card is inserted might be the smarter move. So, on to the user interface. What Fire has done here is to give us what is almost the most stripped Android version they have ever produced in a commercially released product. The Android OS on the M6 and M9 is a bit more slimmed, and even more so on the M7, but both the M6 and M9 also have a lot less software features and functionality, and considerably less so in the case of the M7. The M11 gives you as much of a full-featured Android experience as Fire thought would be appropriate for this kind of device, and I think they've done a great job for the most part. Because there have been just so many unnecessary features and functions removed from the OS, what we get is a much lighter and less resource-intensive version of Android. This results in a way more efficient use of both the processing hardware as well as better power management. In real-world usage, the M11 definitely feels like the smoothest and most responsive device to leave the Fire factory. Then there's also the fantastic battery life you can get from these devices, specifically the standby time. On a regular Android device, such as a mobile phone, you'd be lucky to see two full days of battery life, but that can increase to about a week or more if you put the device in airplane mode. For Fios devices, however, and specifically the M11, you can get up to around 50 days out of a single charge. That's because Fire have tweaked and refined the OS so much, and with thanks to that super power efficient Exynos chipset, that you can leave the device in a deep sleep state and it will draw practically no power at all. 
But of course, when you are actually using the device, then the battery life decreases substantially. There is, however, a pretty big elephant in the room and one which might be a total deal breaker for some people. There is no access to the Google Play Store. This was just something unfortunate that happened through no fault of Fio. On Android, in order for a device to get access to the Play Store, it must pass Google Mobile Services Certification, or GMS for short. That in itself isn't an issue, except for the fact that the M11 was already designed and ready to go when Google announced that they will no longer be issuing GMS certification to devices running any version of Android lower than Android 9. Unfortunately, Samsung has not made the SDK for Android 9 available for the Exynos chipset used in the M11, and so Fire's hands are completely tied in this instance. There is a small silver lining though, and that is that you can install apps but you will need to do so by manually installing the APK file for that app, and it must be for Android 7.0. This also means that you might not be able to update the app to get some of the latest features, or if new features are added to legacy versions, you would need to do the update manually by installing the new version of the app. The only other limitation would be that if whatever app you are using requires you to make any in-app purchases through the Play Store, that obviously won't be available to you either. So, whilst this is a bit of a bummer, in all honesty, I can't really see this as being a major issue for most people. On the M6 and M9, you could get access to some streaming services and other apps, but they had to be whitelisted. Whereas with the M11, you can install essentially any app you want, but you just have to do so manually. It might not be ideal, but it's also not the end of the world either. For the main music player app, the M11 is of course running Fire Music. I'm a big fan of what Fire have done with this app because it has just such a clean and overall easy to use layout. And with each new Android based device that Fire creates, we also see further improvements going into the music app as well. The app actually feels so well designed that when using it I've often found myself forgetting that this is an Android based device, meaning that the app itself looks and feels like I'm using a standalone music player. The layout often feels more intuitive and, dare I say, more modern and refined than what you would find on devices from the likes of even Astel and Kern. As for the sound of this device, for the most part, I've been a fan of the sound of essentially all of Fire's devices. There were only three exceptions which stood out to me, and that was the original X7, the X5 third gen, and then the original Q5. The issue I had with the X7 was that it just didn't live up to the hype for me. It sounded rather bland, and at no point that I listened to any of my music on it did I feel a sense of real enjoyment in listening to that music. Granted, this was with the World Tour unit which still had the original amp module, but I still just couldn't justify the asking price. In contrast, the X7 Mark II was something I felt at the time was worthy of being called a flagship device, as it had a refinement in the sound quality unlike anything else I had heard from Fio. For the X5 third gen and the Q5, these devices felt the same to me in the sense that they both had this overly warm and smooth signature which made them sound more consumer grade than hi-fi to me. So where does this leave the M11? To be quite frank with you, if I think back to the X7 Mark II, the M11 doesn't feel like a downgrade to me. Perhaps the X7 had a bit more of a reference signature, but the slightly warmer and smoother sound of the M11 is something I just ultimately find more enjoyable. Sure, I am making this comparison in relation to the X7 Mark II with the stock amp module, and you can get some noticeable improvements to the X7 by using one of Fio's better performing modules, but at what cost? The total price for the X7 Mark II plus an extra amp module will set you back nearly double what the M11 will, and the M11 is far more versatile and feature-packed and an arguably more enjoyable sounding device. Those dual AK4493 DAC chips are integrated well and in such a way that I find the M11 to just sound so natural and non-fatiguing. It can also easily drive my modified HD58X, even on low gain and via the single ended output, and the added power of the balanced circuitry makes these headphones sound practically as good as anything else I've connected them to, with the exception being of course standalone external decks like the iFi Micro Black Label and the Cord Hugo. Still, it's important to remember that the M11 is a portable device, 
and in portable settings you are almost certainly unlikely to be able to really discern the difference in sound quality between a device like the M11 and an external DAC device. The FIO has the kick and control in the bass regions and equally presents treble sparkles and shimmers in a manner that never feels excessive or otherwise artificial. Vocals are clear and inviting with a sense of realism that, again, never feels overdone nor lacking. I think if I compare it to the DX150 from Ibasso, the M11 doesn't have quite the same sense of space as the DX150 has, but the slightly warmer and smoother sound of the M11 also feels more fitting and natural for the majority of music genres. But again, we are talking about such small differences here. It's those differences that you really have to listen for, ones that you have to concentrate on trying to find. But in the end, all this means is that you're trying to find subtle nuances in sounds rather than actually listening to music. And that, arguably, negates the entire purpose of listening to music. Honestly, I don't feel that those incredibly subtle differences in sound can or should justify the often immense difference in price that follows. And this leads us to the value that the M11 brings to the table. The thing FIO has pretty much always done, but even more so in more recent times, is to pack a ton of value in their devices in terms of build quality, functionality, versatility, and features. Where this concerns the M11 is the fact that I don't know if this device has any real competition from any other brand. If we consider the device as a whole, the great sound quality, the excellent display, the dual card slots, the sheer number of output choices you are given, as well as the option to install a huge library of third-party applications, and all of that at a price of just $450? Sure, $450 is not a small amount of money, but there really doesn't seem to be any alternative out there. If you wanted to get this type of device with this many features and excellent build quality from a company such as Estel & Kern, for example, you are going to pay way over $1,000, if not into the multiple thousand dollar territory. The closest competitor I can currently think of would be the DX150, which already costs a bit more than the M11. And if you wanted more output options, that would require you to buy a different amp module, which of course would increase the cost even more so. This is why I say, when you really go and look at the big picture, the M11 has no real competition in terms of how feature-packed it is relative to the asking price. In terms of Fio's own production portfolio, I think perhaps the M6 still holds slightly more bang for buck value, but Fio have managed to accomplish something within their lineup which few others have. Normally, we can take a look at a company's devices and look at the features and performance of those devices and then compare those objective characteristics relative to the asking price. Then, at a rather specific location within the broad pricing scheme of that lineup, we would be able to see the point of diminishing returns whereby the increase in the prices of subsequent devices do not have a direct correlation with the objective performance or list of features of those devices. So, what makes FIO different is that I really cannot find a clear point of diminishing returns. As you move from the M6 to the M9, the price jumps up by $150, but despite that, you still get the exact same operating system and software features, but you gain more output options and more driving power along with a slight increase in audio quality. So, in that instance, the increase in cost relative to the increase in performance and features doesn't feel quite as linear as it should. However, then the M11 comes along and with a further increase of $150 over that of the M9, the M11 gives you even more output options, more than double the driving power and a much more responsive and versatile user interface. It's when we consider this that it almost seems like the M6 and the M11 pack essentially the same bang for buck value regardless of the fact that the M11 costs three times as much as the M6. So really, I do have to admire what FIO has managed to pull off here and I think the M11 will mostly serve as a warning to other manufacturers, especially the super pricey ones, that they need to pull up their socks because if they don't, FIO is going to overtake them, if that hasn't already happened. 
So well done to Fire for creating such an incredible device and at such a reasonable price. It's going to be interesting to see what Fire does next to further up the ante and what devices other manufacturers release in response to the M11. This device gets my highest recommendation if you don't mind the size. Sure, it would have been nice if it was a little bit smaller, that would make it a little bit more portable, but for what it is, it is a fantastic multimedia device. Well, that's the end of this review. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did so, please hit that like button. And if you didn't like it, please hit that dislike button twice. For any questions or comments, please leave them down below. That's all from me for now, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.